Um, I think we're going to kick straight off by showing one of your recent music videos um, and then we can kind of talk about the process behind directing that and your kind of tra trajectory getting to that point. So if we could play the Your Mum video. When I think about what you So this video got you a nomination for the UK Music Video Awards yeah. um, last year, and you, mm -hmm. you were direct, uh, you were nominated both as director and uh, performing artist for those awards. It would be great to hear you talk a bit about your experience um, directing that particular video and the kind of visual references that you're drawing from um, in Lava Land and the process of kind of matching sonic and visual narratives at the same time. Wow, that was so many questions in one <laughs> go. I'm like, there's so much to unpack there. Um, for this specific music video, I think it came to me like I'm, I'm one of those people in the intersection of being both a musician and a director that when I hear a song, I instantly like see visuals. So I remember the first time I was played this song and I was in the band's hometown, the Isle of Wight, and this was before the album came out. And I listened to this song and instantly I was like, oh my God, I'm seeing, imagine you guys are like in a shop, but like there's like Easter eggs of the rest of the album. Like the, the uniform that you're wearing is like another track of the project. And then like there's a newspaper stand that like this protagonist walks by and it like gives clues to what's gonna happen in the rest of the video. And then you're reading the newspaper and you're looking for it. So all of that happened like really quickly. Um, and then it's sort of like, okay, cool. Yeah, let's just do it. Let's make that happen. Um, but I think it was my first time specifically in this video working with a full film crew where there was like a head of each department. So, you know, I had like my first AD, there was like a head of sort of like, yeah, set design and like lighting crew and the sound department also because this was something where I wanted to get dialogue at the beginning. Um, so I was working in a way that was different to when I had made music videos in the past that was quite run and gun and sometimes I'd be doubling up as sort of like, you know, cameraman or yeah, things like that. So it was really interesting specifically for this seeing like the differences of like working in both of those worlds um but the the actual aesthetic inspiration um came from watching like one of my favorite directors is edgar wright who did like scott pilgrim vs the world and um yeah shawn of the dead like just like those very classic like the cornetto trilogy mm -hmm. um and i really liked the style of like quick pan zooms and like the, the Britishness in like all of the Simon Pegg collaborations, but then the, the indie vibes of sort of like Scott Pilgrim vs. the world. So there was a couple of like references I wanted where I wanted to merge the work of Edgar Wright also with this kind of like Napoleon Dynamite um, like era look on Britishness. Cause I don't know if we've seen the film Napoleon Dynamite, but it's really funny and kitsch. And there's sometimes when I go to like um, sleepy British towns like the Isle of Wight or, you know, Margate, it almost feels sometimes I'm like, I kind of feel like I'm in Napoleon Dynamite, but kind of like a, a British or like a Jeremy Carl <laughs> version of it. Um, and I thought it'd be really cool to show that aspect instead of it in like an Americana way, like this, this kind of like quite rural Englishness where mm. it feels quite like stuck in an era. So yeah, to answer that big <laughs> question, that would be how I'd kind of like summarize the influences, how it landed in my lap, what it was like working on it and, yeah, being a musician and doubling up on those two awards, which was cool. Great. And, yeah. and like you said, you're often you're, you're both a musician and a director, so maybe we can talk about a time in which you've been the musician and you've kind of had to give the trust to another director and how you found that process. I know we have the um, video for Magpie Clit, which was directed by Milo Blake, also uh, nominated for a UK MVA uh, award two years ago, I believe. Let's watch that and then we can kind of talk about some of the visual symbolism in it. Cool.
I really like that video because I think it does such a great job of taking us on like both a kind of historical journey through London because you're seeing like all these different eras and subcultures mm -hmm. and subgroups referenced but also an emotional journey because you've got this aspect of like just the fun light-hearted kind of random encounters that you can have on public transport with also like a nod to some of the more kind of sinister sides of the city mm -hmm. and like an allusion to um, the tragedy of Grenfell and, and the kind of financialization of, of, of property. Um, I was I'm curious to hear about your experience on the other side of the camera in, in this piece and how you worked collaboratively with, with Milo and what that was like. Yeah, it, that, that one's a really interesting one. Also, it's just so funny seeing myself up there like as a musician because sometimes I so compartmentalise that I'm like, that is definitely me and I definitely <laughs> made that song and like was part of the storyboarding process, but I almost like when it's in its like final form and it's out in the world because it's been out for a while, I kind of like forget sometimes but when I go back and scratch my head about like remembering the process like putting that video together it's really interesting being someone who's so heavy on the creative and can be a director of learning when to be like actually I need to give this to someone to make that vision happen especially if in this case I'm going to be in like front of the camera you know yeah I can't be sort of like both in front of the car and giving the best performance and then also looking at like the monitor at the same time making sure everything's going good so it's like getting the right people who you feel like can get, you can like trust to do that, but also feeling like someone who's fully understood and you've communicated what the concept is. So you know that like on the day, all I have to think about is like getting in hair and makeup, like making sure everyone's sort of like blessed and then getting in front of that camera and doing a good job. So that meant there was so much that went into like the prep mm -hmm. leading up to that um, to make sure that like when I got that, I knew that it was going to be like correct. And then also like, I think when, touching on topics where I wanted to represent so many aspects of like my identity, my Caribbean heritage, being British, coming from West London, like my experience of what I went through with like Grenfell Tower, all these things, they're quite like, you know, really tender subjects that you, you, you want to do it right. You don't want it to seem like a gimmick for a music video. So like the prep for that was really interesting. But then the number one thing is also in, in the pre-production of like making this music video, the budget for that music video was half of the budget as, as the one as the wet leg video that I worked on. So it's like, how do I manage to encapsulate all of that also working with the limit of that budget? And so Milo was so amazing in terms of like, helping me manifest, I'd like mood boarded it, like exactly the topics I wanted to touch upon, the energy, the styling, all of that. And then Milo had done such an fantastic job of like storyboarding it into being like, okay, so what if with the limitations of the budget that we have, it happens all in one carriage. Mm -hmm. And I think like both as a director and as a musician, a real interesting sort of like learning point when you're creating stuff is like having different concepts for the limitations or things that you're you're given so it's like a really easy mistake for young directors to make to have a really like big budget concept but like try and make that work with a small budget so to come up with like loads of ideas of like this is how you can have this feeling of like grandeur and like a big feeling but if you limit it to like one location but make sure all of like the you, you spend what's rest on that on making the art direction correct and its research it ends up with the same result really which is like two fantastic music videos do you know what i mean so yeah i think yeah, part of that process was making sure that was communicated, making sure we had a concept that kind of worked with this like one track feeling. And and yeah, it all came together like really nicely. And it meant, yeah, when when it came on the day, like I was just really happy. And also the stylist as well is like just very researched and like had like archive pieces from the eras we were trying to reckon. I think those little attention to details, um, yeah, is kind of like, I'll probably like draw upon that point like later. But yeah, I think specifically that video for me was all about that. And I, I do feel like we nailed it. So yeah. <laughs> <Agreed>. <laughs> that may say so myself. Um, you've spoken about how that song is kind of a personification of your relationship with London. Mm -hmm. And I think you've got a really interesting way of not only um, writing lyrics about, but also visualizing place-based identity. So I wanted to talk a bit about your relationship. Um, with the city because it's clear that London has kind of really influenced your cultural input um, output from like a hyper local level to like your area in West London like 
There's this shot and I think it's the Vest and Boxes video that I love and it's like you kind of walking past um, Twilight oh, Tower Twilight with like yeah. twirling an umbrella and yeah. it's like a landmark that kind of like pops up in a few of your videos. Yeah. But then you also articulate how like West London culture feeds into the big like um, wider dynamics when it comes to British identity and, and recent history. Um, in Britain, for example, you talk about West London as like a meeting point for, for punks and people who listen to reggae and how sometimes there was hostility between these groups, sometimes there was a synergy between them, but mm. this um, then feeds into bigger questions in the UK about um, immigration and the rise of the, the far right. Um, so I, I know that this like West London's unique uh, contribution to the wider culture in the UK, something that you've looked at in your documentary Westbourne, mm -hmm. um, made to be screened at the Tate in 2018, was yeah, it? With yeah. Forever Films. Yeah. Um, we're going to play a, ki a clip from that and then maybe we can talk a little bit about it. Great, I'm so young at this, I'm so excited <laughs> for this. <laughs> 65 or 66, one of those years. Just at the top of this street actually, Tavistock Road, there used to be a playground. The woman who ran the playground there decided to give the kids a treat. So she invited the local guys to come, the steel band guys to play. She invited this man. And when he put the drums around his neck, he thought, well, why don't I go out in the street a little bit? And the kids followed him like the Pied Piper. And that's how the carnival began. So when I came along as a young man, I thought that I would have everyone joining, meaning from every other island. The first year I attracted 50,000 people, from 500 to 50,000. The second year I had a quarter of a million, so the police got a little bit jumpy. The council got a bit jumpy, because they weren't prepared for it. And 76 had a huge riot. In those days there was something called suspicion, the sus laws. So young people like yourself, and I when I was young, the police would Pick, pick on you and can arrest you on suspicion of, imagine that, just on suspicion. So all the young people were so upset about this law, the young people who felt picked on by the police, which in many instances were absolutely true because they're young and black, had a chance to fight back against the, the police. But really and truly, um, it, it's, it's, as, as you can see, it has grown so wonderfully well and it's such a wonderful location, um, and people don't, are not scared anymore to come. Uh, you know, the Caribbean people have uh, contributed so much to this society in dress, in music, you know, and now the carnival. If you go to any embassy, suppose you went to Holland and you, want, you went to the British embassy, suppose you went to America, suppose you went to Africa, you went to the British embassy, in each embassy, like in the town hall here, RBKC, you will find pictures of the carnival of women dancing with the police to show what a wonderful place Britain is. To see what to show what a wonderful, you know, multiracial society we have. So they use the carnival, the establishment, for their own ends. To show how wonderful we all live together. But it isn't necessarily so, is it? <laughs> right. Funny. For context, it's me talking to Leslie Palm, he's one of the um, co-founders, the inventors of Carnival um, in West London, and I am literally a baby in that, it's so, yeah, <laughs> I'm so young. <laughs> Even so, it would be great to hear you like talk a bit about your involvement in, in that documentary yeah. and how moving image kind of allows you to gather like overlapping moments and, and movements in, in history and then share them yeah. with a wider audience, and if you have any thoughts on film's kind of unique ability when it comes to preserving all of the musical histories, which sure. this documentary does talk about a lot. Yeah, so like to give context of how this documentary came together is that um, I run an arts collective called 9-8 uh, alongside Love LaRue. We like put on events and the Tate had like contacted through my amazing management um, for us to um, do like a night like at the Tate Lates that they do. Mm. And like we're commissioning us like it was totally up to us what we did and how we like took over the Tate for that night. And yeah, I can't, I must have been when that was filmed, 19, maybe 20, I can't remember, but um, I was determined that I wanted to make a documentary about West London. They wanted it to be something about like our collective movement and what like our events and kind of like bringing like almost like a rave to the tape. But I just thought it was so important and I was so adamant to like contextualize a lot of things about British, British culture that a lot of people accept, but don't necessarily like recognize its roots mm. and so there's a couple of things that we touch upon like 
you know, when uh, I have a lot of people who are, like come, come to me and they're like, oh, you're from West London. Like, isn't that really posh though? Isn't that like Chelsea? I only go to West London for carnival. <laughs> and like, so like not necessarily knowing, well, actually, yeah, there's, there's, there's like a lot of, prosperity and there's a lot of like rich people and on one side you have sort of like Notting Hill and Chelsea on the other side you also have like Grenfell and Latimer and that like yeah there's 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 like some of the starkest divide of like ultra lit rich living back to back with ultra poor but also there's um so much historical context like the clash came from West London like the Sex Pistols and you know when I worked when I interviewed Don Letts when he was doing his sort of like documentary tour around the UK like it's really interesting seeing that intersection where like you know the the wave of like kids from the Windrush generation who came over here and white working class kids came together and started making new genres together and started like you know doing events together and started you know and then sound system like culture came from like Jamaica and then went to sort of like um, New York and started like the whole hip hop scene and then came over here and then started the sound system scene and then through that we had things like jungle and drum and bass then we had like garage MCs then we had grime MCs and then now we have like drill so there's so many things that we just see in like popular UK culture and not everybody recognises loads of different places where that like stems mm. from so I just felt like if I was going to go to the Tate and represent sort of like me and it's so funny because this was like I must have been like two years out of like dropping out of um, Art Foundation at Ravensbourne and I felt like this was like I dropped out started Love LaRue about like six months later, like um, met my management, like after I was like, okay, I want to do this properly. And I actually generally felt like this documentary was like my final year project that I never got to do at uni um, or at Art Foundation, sorry. So yeah, that was, that was the contextualization to that. What was the rest of your question again? Um, <laughs> I went on a rant. What do you think, um, why film is such an important medium when it comes to preserving oral? Yeah, that stories. was it, sorry. That's what I was going to say. So yeah, I feel like the reason why it needed to be a documentary is because I was able to give like a 360 experience of where I was at. So even the music that you heard there was all composed by me and my friends and the collective. And these are the people who I started making music with like from when I was in my early teens, just making beats with. So to commission like people from my actual like local scene and community to make the sound of it and to like have like my friends working behind the camera and like filming it on VHS and like 16 millimeter. And like, yeah, having sort of like my friends and people in my local community featuring it you're, and also the, a lot of the clothes that we were wearing in this and like across my videos are elements of like m the clothes that like I design or my friends design or like references to sort of like the streetwear culture. You're literally like seeing it. You're seeing like the textures of the clothing. You're hearing the sounds like you're, you're recognizing the location. It's just like world building really of like what that is and trying to like um, you know, street cast it in a way that a lot of people like who are featuring it are just sort of like friends who are like talking about it to make it feel as like authentic and realistic to how it really is for us on a day-to-day -day life, really. But yeah, in a, in a long run, I think, yeah, moving image and like that's the best way you can kind of get that with the no, sounds, right. I suppose, yeah. Because like my mum will talk to me about early carnival or things like Rock Against Racism and I, I kind of just brush it off. But mm. then it's the times when I've seen it in front of me in a documentary or in a short film and stuff, and then it, like just having that visual it merges. Makes it so so much you need to see how it comes evocative. together. Like, even seeing him talk about like the history of like when he started like co-founding Notting Hill Carnival, and you see it in its early days, and you see it as a protest. And most people don't know that Carnival mm -hmm. started out as a protest, like the first Carnival, like you know, turned into a riot. Mm -hmm. And so seeing it go from that, and then seeing it sort of like in the sixties and the seventies or whatever, and then seeing it like today. And seeing like, actually, there's not a huge difference. This is the same location. And, you know, you feel the police presence in sort of like Carnival today, but seeing how it's merged and then a lot and people just go with like no context to that. It's so important. And I think what's important is that you don't just necessarily need to be from like a Caribbean British heritage like me to care about mm -hmm. that or be informed about that. Like the influence that it's given to culture as a whole, if you're proud to be British, this should be like something you should also equally be proud of because mm -hmm. it's such a part of our identity. And when we turn on the radio, you hear the influences of that. When you see people and how they dress or even just people like Wagwan, yo, mm -hmm. just stuff like that. Like not knowing where like some of the slang that we all say, mm -hmm. do you know what I mean? I think it's so important for everyone to be informed in that and it creates more of like a solidarity uh, rather than like that's them and this is us and like there's this movement happening and I feel I can't talk about it, or I'm not part of it or I'm scared of saying the wrong thing if there's kind of this like unified actually there's a shared experience here and an under like that education of that is like the best thing so to do that through music video or documentary is like it's cool and it's cool for me like in my music as well it helps inform what I'm trying to say like yeah it gives context when people listen to my own stuff like what it's about really 
Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so Westbourne is a, one of the, the longer kind of longer format um, pieces of, of film that you've worked on, but you also talk about a lot of the themes that that documentary raises via TikTok, mm -hmm. which like, you used to give really great film yeah. like recommendations and film breakdowns, um, but you also use it to talk about current affairs, like you said, educating people on uh, cultural history, um, and at times offering like really quite urgent political commentary, which mm. I think subverts a lot of people's notions of like and you having this really superficial um, use of TikTok. And I was wondering what your thoughts are on your position as an artist with like all this kind of screen technology that we have at our disposal um, and using that to talk about politics. Yeah, it's a blessing and a curse. I think that like I have been someone where I like to go online and use my opinion. I can understand why a lot of people have like sees things like TikTok and think like, oh, Gen Z, like superficial, like people just going on here to just like look good and pretend to be like woke or whatever. Um, and, and I completely understand why a lot of people think that because there is some of that, but there's, there's always been that before like social media existed, there was always people going on like TV or reality shows or whatever, like a, a form of media is just a form of media and it's what you use for it. Like it is totally up to you. It's essentially just a blank canvas. And I think for me, I quite like to go on it to talk about like my politics or like recontextualize or do like breakdowns of like what I'm working on like the same way I'm talking to you because I think that it gives a level of accessibility and like social mobility to people. There's like I'm self-taught by a lot of things through like studying it on the internet or like downloading a masterclass and being able to watch like Spike Lee like do breakdowns of how he like makes his videos and it's absolutely like changed the way I've seen things and allowed access despite like you know what what your class is like some of it you do have to pay for and like that's not necessarily accessible for a lot of people but there's a lot of information out there and it just feels like scary for a lot of people because it feels drowned out by so much other crap that you have mm -hmm. to sift through to get to it mm -hmm. but I think uh, like to not get into it too much I think that yeah, there's so <laughs> there's so much about politics and the jargon of politics that makes it so unaccessible to people like when I try and talk to like a lot of my cousins who are like from the hood about politics a lot of the words and jargon that's used is like specifically put there mm. to make it seem like really like I don't know what's going on what does what does this mean constitutional this and you know like even like what's going on with like the union strikes up for a lot of people some people don't necessarily understand the politics of like yeah but this is how it actually works yeah. and this is the media saying this the paper saying this but that's not really so sometimes having someone just sort of like go online and be like this is where I'm at here's a simplified breakdown of kind of what it is it allows different people from different walks of life to be like oh actually that makes sense and when it comes to liberal politics or left-leaning politics or queer politics or gender studies so much of the language is so inaccessible to people like there's a lot of people who come on and try and talk about it but are just trying to prove like how educated they are on the matter to the point where it comes it becomes condescending to people who might not have that education that's why it's been so easy for like the right-wing world of like internet politics to sway all these people into thinking like you know they're they who should be their comrades are their enemies and thinking it's like migrants who are the problems or do you know what i mean because actually it's so simple being like it's them it's their fault opposed to doing a big breakdown of like actually there's a spectrum and there's like so many intersections and actually when you look at it it's quite simple we just have like a common oppressor do you know what i mean so yeah anyway <laughs> when it comes to tiktok sometimes i do like to just hop on and be like this is my this is my thought on the situation and like this is my experience and this is what I've like researched and like maybe this can make it a bit simpler to for someone else to be like oh yeah actually I share that opinion and maybe you're not so different mm. like to me in a nutshell. <laughs> um, I'm aware we're running out of time so I'm just going to ask one last question before mm -hmm. we open up to the audience but um, I want to circle back to something you were talking about um adjusting your ideas for a music video depending on on your budget mm -hmm. and your your most recent album is called high fidelity and you've mm -hmm. spoken about how that is um in reference to the fact that you've been able to move away from maybe like some of the low fidelity relatively like low cost um music modes of music production you've as your career's grown and your success has grown and you've got more financial resources you can kind of use live bands and live instrumentalists uh, Previously, when you were like operating on a lower budget, you were still making these really striking, um, memorable musical videos. So I, I was wondering what your kind of experience um, of and, and also like advice is for people who are like working with a lower budget, making um, short clips. 
Yeah, for sure. I could speak about this forever. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, the most like recent music video that I dropped that I directed, which only came out a couple of days ago, was actually a, a, it was a similar situation to how I used to make videos, where I was like hit up to be the director, like literally 24 hours before we were supposed to shoot, had like 48 hours all together to shoot it. So there was like zero pre-production time, and then we, the label wanted it with like a one-week turnaround before they break for Christmas, and. Like the first thing that I do in a situation like this is I actually have like a, a, a notes like of different budget sort of like ideas depending on what my budget is. So like I have like zero budget music video ideas, 5K budget ideas, 10K budget ideas, 50K and above and, and so on. And it's not necessarily about having like these concrete ideas where it's like, okay, this is what we're gonna do because you wanna cater it to the artist and what they want and the song and the brief. But a big mistake that I feel like I've recognized yeah a lot of like people who are starting out and trying to work on like low budget music videos is like having this sort of like grand concept it being a really good concept and wanting to execute or, or get that kind of vibe without you know having without instead of coming up with like a concept that can really work surrounding the the resources that they have so that magpie video is a good example because it's like okay cool we want to give all this energy so let's limit it down to one location and that means that we can really get like do be research in those minute details of sort of like the styling and that and so like when it comes to watching videos that are like maybe low budget you can see the difference of maybe someone who spent all the budget on like a flashy sort of like car and then there's nothing specifically in terms of like editing and color grading or someone who wants to make like an indie flick and but they and it has like a really cool like narrative but they haven't been able to like think too much about the art of the set or all the things that make like cool kitsch aesthetic like indie films look so cool mm -hmm. and then you have music videos where actually it is full budget but the concept is executed so well and then they've like put a lot into the post to make like the color grade feel like really cinematic and the editing feel really good that you kind of feel get that there's like a huge difference between that and something that's like a 100k like video that's like you know on MTV do you know mm -hmm. what I mean so I think like understanding the difference as to when to apply that idea and then also utilizing the sort of like um benefits that you may have in the scene around you so like a lot of the stuff that I did when I was doing low budget music but I was like okay cool I don't necessarily have the budget to hire this really cool place but who do I know who has like a mad yard or a studio or whatever like it doesn't even need to be bougie just something that looks captivating because I can't afford a set designer so what feels like you know when I go to place and I'm like I'll pull up to someone's yard at a house party and I'm like I'm gonna ask if I can use this for a music video and I'll just like buy them a couple of pints if I can use this do you know what I mean so I was just utilizing mm -hmm. things around me to sort of create that world and and it meant that I was able to do more. So going back to this um, music video that I recently edited, like I realized that I had no pre-production time. So I decided to make it animation heavy and I put most of the budget on an animator because which meant, okay, I don't have enough time to pull in a crew. So I'm just gonna film it myself on like, it was basically a DSLR camera with sort of like a stabilizer and I filmed it myself and it meant I was able to give it to an animator and they were able to make something phenomenal and just as striking as if I had, you know, a month of like pre-production prep and like 10K more on the budget. So it's just, and it was just like, a, like I had like an idea on my phone already of like the kind of things I would do if I was to work with this specific animator and I already knew what his fees were as well so I was like okay this can work within it and it's going to look like this was intentional the whole time mm. um it's called Picking Up by Big Pig you should check it out it's a great music video and it came out like two days ago but yeah um whereas working on situations where I am able to have a film crew, I am able to build up on the narrative I can also sort of like hone in on that and it and it's nice building up to that point as well um, because you really know how you're going to do it when you do have the budget. Mm. So, mm. yeah, bit of a babble, but you no, get I, I you get the point. That's all really, like. really useful. <laughs> you have one TikTok, and it's like five films that made me want to become a director. Mm -hmm. um, does that mean that we can expect or hope for any kind of longer films from you in the future, or, or, or what kind of things are you working on? Yeah, I think that like long term, I've always looked up to musician directors like Donald Glover, obviously. Um, FK Twigs, like Twigs is amazing, um, Kali Uchis as well. Um, and I think that going back to the very first music video we watched, the Wet Leg one, there was loads of references to the wider lava lamp. Also the main character was wearing like a cardigan that I had designed and there was like little pointings to like just in the details of the print or little things where it was like references to my own, like there was another person who had like the butt of my first ever EP that I wore, like a print of that. and um, 
and like little graphics that I made. And so I've always looked up to people who do like world building and leave Easter eggs in like one music video that you'll then pick up at another music video. So you'll see something that you saw in that wet leg video. You also, it was in the beginning of the magpie video. If you like looked really closely as well. Um, so yeah, I think that as I grow my career as a musician, I want to create like a whole universe around it. And you'll absolutely see that with like what I'm planning to do over like the next couple of years. Um, but yeah, one day I would definitely love to make sort of like a full feature and continue to make like the actual music videos more cinematic. But yeah, even though it's weird watching me in that like tape thing, cause I was like, wow, that was like quite a few years ago. I still feel like I'm only just starting like now. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm excited to see where it happens like in like 10 years when I'm 34, do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Something to look forward to. Yeah. I think I'd like to cross over into doing something that is like an intersection of those two things. So I think like a music based drama or things that are based around sort of like the the subcultural scene that influences my music would be really cool. Yeah. I think I'm like people who know me, I'm very intense in my storyboarding and that like I go really deep into like 15, 20 pages of sort of like context and contextualization. Yeah, basically like building up the world. But I think that's more so to make sure that everyone in the crew and everyone I, I bring on know what the theme is, know what the aesthetic is, know what the narrative is. And then once we're actually there, I don't want to choke the flames of if something goes off script or off the storyboards and something very beautifully happens. I feel like especially in the world that I like to sort of like work on in music videos, it's very much about like the culture and the vibe. So if something naturally happens between two people or, you know, the, the DOP was like, actually, yeah, I want to do this or do this vibe. I'm always super, I'll never be like, you know, obviously there's a producer who can kind of be the person and it's like, we don't have time for that. And I let them play bad cop and I can be the good cop. But I think I go really deep into the storyboarding just so that they get the vibe. And it's super clear and everyone knows the reference of what I'm talking about. And once everyone's on the same page, I like to see where we go from there. And those little moments of magic is sometimes what makes like the best scenes. So yeah, it's, it's all about the balance. <laughs> um... I think the first thing is that like growing up, I studied people who had done that for themselves. So I think I was definitely inspired by Pharrell Williams, who obviously like was a producer with like the Neptunes. And there was one point where he had produced like so many like top hits from like Gwen Stefani to like Justin Timberlake. At that same time, he was also working with Nigo who does Bape and was doing Billionaire Boys Club. He started like later on Human Made. Um, he also had his own collective NERD. So I was looking at people who are musicians who like were heavy on sort of like creating the whole world where you don't just hear the music, but there's the clothes and the visuals and the collaborators and things they had done like behind the scenes with other people. And I kind of yeah definitely kind of like looked at how he did it and there was never anyone necessarily from like my background and was also like non-binary and queer and Caribbean who I could look to who had done that but I looked to different people around the world who I felt like were a good reference and then directors who I felt like had done another thing and yeah I just kind of studied it and tried to utilize what I had to try and like build it there but also finding your people and like trialing out and being open to different people before I was like directing I was obviously a musician every time I'd walk onto sort of like set whether it was an editorial or something filmed I like to get familiar with the rest of the crew and like it's kind of crazy how much talent don't actually do that like when I was working on like music videos I was talking to the grip and the gaff and be like yo what's your name oh cool how do you get into that and like that really helped as well actually that was a massive help understanding also just like the jargon otherwise it feels so inaccessible so yeah not being afraid to like do that for me because I didn't have any formal education and sort of like I didn't go to like film school when I was doing fashion um sorry when I was doing my um foundation course I was doing fashion promotion so nothing to do with film it's just getting to know people on set so yeah that that little like balance of like studying it getting to know people is like in a long term like that does definitely help with that yeah for just because it's like it's so ranged I think that like I definitely started out with a mixed media aspect um, 
And yeah, I, I definitely started out predominantly like using things like VHS and camcorders and HD, but also trying to mix match them so you felt things texture wise. And something that I've been working on like a lot in the past like two or three years is like printing out things frame by frame and rescanning them back in, which you like, I feel like you're gonna see in a lot of music videos at the moment. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't be like, I think people are lying when you're like, if you're gonna start out, you need to start out with this Sony AV7. There's no, like, it's really not about that. It's about what you feel comfortable with really. And just like trying to recognize what aesthetic style do you wanna go for? And what are the components that build up that kind of vibe? And sometimes making a mood board and having it in front of you and being like, okay, this is the vibe that I like. If, then you can kind of like break down, okay, how is that actually made and what equipment would they use? Because I can come and tell you, yeah, use a VHS because when I was making that documentary, we used VHS and we shot on 16 and eight millimeter, but actually you might want something that's really clean and glossy, in which case I'd like reference something else. So make a mood board and figure out what was used for that. And there's loads of websites and when you can just type in film, like what camera did they use? Do you know what I mean? And that, that kind of like, it's way better than me. <laughs> Anyone else? Okay, I think we'll end it there then. So thank awesome. you so much. Yeah. Yeah.